Hi, Megan. Hey, Christy. Good to see you. You too. Thank you for joining me. Part of the reason that I wanted to talk to you is because I found myself having chats with therapists about grief and loss just offline. And when I would look on the internet about grief and loss and want to get more in depth, a lot of what I was finding was pretty shallow, even like the Kubler-Ross and mm -hmm. I took a class on grief and loss. And I still found so much of it pretty wanting. And then I thought, I'm just going to start like recording them in case there are people like me on the internet who want to get more information and get more of a depthful phenomenon. It's funny because you're one of the first people I know who studied grief and loss years ago, actually. You had just finished your master's in therapy. You were posting on Facebook that one of your focuses, little foci, was grief and loss. And I remember thinking, why would anyone want to focus on that? It sounds so sad. <laughs> and now that I'm a therapist, psychologist in training, it's funny because now I completely relate. It's one of the most hard things that people deal with. And so my attention is completely there as a therapist. Mm -hmm. How did you develop a passion for grief? It's a good question. Grief work. Well, my therapist in grad school specialized in grief. And I think when we started kind of, because as you know, you have, to, you have to go to therapy and get a certain amount amount of hours while you're studying. When we started kind of processing some childhood trauma that I experienced is when she really kind of gave me a sense of grief as being a much more expansive sort of definition. Um, it certainly can include traumatic experiences because if you experience some kind of loss of safety, that can look like a grief response. And so she gave me that lens. And I didn't, I don't think that I had an understanding of, like you said, how much more expansive grief is. I had more of that shallow, similar kind of understanding with the, the stages of grief, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so we started doing a process together. It's called the grief recovery method. And there's actually a book that takes you through a step-by-step -step process. It's therapeutic in nature, but it's more of an action-based kind of process, maybe similar to what you would do in like AA, um, kind of working those steps. Um, define, so, define grief. I know so it's a good question, and I think it's an important piece here. I would define grief as you know something something that happened that caused you to kind of wish that it was different or better mm. in some way, um, some kind of major um, ending or change um, in your life, which. You know, like in the DSM, we might call adjustment, but actually I feel like a more appropriate umbrella term for these kinds of experiences is grief. Mm. Um, Almost sounds like a breach in expectation. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about that? Yeah. So when you talk about um, wanting things to be a certain way and then they're not, well, that sounds to me like expectation. And mm -hmm. I mean, loss is typically, well, you expect your mom to be alive the next day and then she dies, for example. That's, it's, that's more of a loss than, you know, grieving that your favorite restaurant doesn't carry your favorite food, but, right, right. More, and you have an expectation for it, but it's, it sounds like expectation is at the root there. Yeah, expectation, some kind of attachment to something right and so yeah there's definitely a spectrum right like where you're you you get to the restaurant where you have this kind of vision that you're going to have these I don't know delicious beignets or something and they're sold out um, <laughs> um yeah that's usually something like that you can feel and hopefully move through pretty quickly um but yeah there's a spectrum there right and yeah so I do think that a breach of expectation that's a, another interesting kind of definition and I think it really kind of captures that more expansive quality of grief too I like that yeah um, I I was reading the grief and recovery method and um, and there they said that the which I know you're trained in um, 
and I took some notes as grief is the normal and natural reaction to a significant emotional loss of any kind. Mm -hmm. Grief is the conflicting feelings caused mm -hmm. by the end of or change in a familiar pattern mm -hmm. of behavior. Mm -hmm. Grief is the feeling of reaching out for someone who has always been there only to find that you need them again and they're no longer there. Is there anything you would add to that or misconceptions that people have about what grief is or is not? Yeah, I would definitely speak to the, the, what you were bringing up about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and um, just this research that she did. Um, and in fact, the research that she did was really about people who were dying. And so that quickly um, got translated into a set of stages that, that all grievers or people who are experiencing grief could kind of attach to. And of course, that's because we like to put things in categories and, and kind of make them more sim simply understood, right? Isn't it? Then that was also the first kind of theory that we had for loss, yes. right? And so yes. I think that was, that's also like the best we have. And I think the name of her main book was Death and Dying. Mm -hmm. That's that right. right. That's right. Um, this also had been quoted as saying later that, you know, I, I never intended to say that people move through these stages, right, when they experience a loss. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, sometimes, you know, I have clients who will come in and say, I think I'm experiencing, you know, some kind of denial um, or um, I think I'm getting to some kind of bargaining stage or whatever, you know, these, the DABDA stages of grief. And um, if you really think about that, um, it, it doesn't really tap into what is going on emotionally for the person. It allows them to kind of stay in an intellectual place. And of course, you know, we need to have some kind of intellectual um, conversation to get into that place, but it, it keeps them there. And and I think that's kind of, um, that's kind of what we've got for tools mm. are a whole lot of intellectual comments and they've just been passed down. These sort of sayings that you've probably heard and maybe even said yourself, you know, um, that the book also does really address um, in the, the first chapters, these kind of myths that, you know, people need space when they're grieving and that they should just be alone. We should give them space and people should grieve by themselves or that time heals with time. People will feel better. And, um, this, these kinds of ideas that like, you know, even kind of based on your religious or spiritual beliefs that somebody dies, they're not in pain anymore. Or they're in a better place. Um, these kinds of comments all they're all simply their intellectual comments and they're 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 made to with good intention you know um, people want to be able to say something that they think is going to make someone feel better but in actuality it's quite an interruption to somebody's emotional process and experience and the message is really underneath that like don't feel bad, right? You need to just kind of move on. Um, you need to move forward. You need to be strong. You need to be strong for the other people who are really suffering and have bigger, better reason to suffer, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of comparative like suffering that happens too, you know? And um, so I think staying in the intellectual realm is is dangerous for people. And if they get those kinds of responses, it just pushes them further into isolation. Mm, yeah. Or that's I, where you get to depression, you know, grief and depression are d different things. They almost look, to, look exactly the same. Mm -hmm. They have very similar symptoms. And so that's why people can easily say, I think I'm depressed. But, but if you're actually having a response to a major change in your life or a loss of a loved one, you're grieving mm -hmm. but if you if you get sort of you don't get a process of resolving that grief you get kind of enmeshed in it you get pushed into isolation because you feel invalidated by others that's when you start to kind of I think 
you should be concerned. That yeah. can be the question, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I'd love to talk about more about what differentiates in your, you know, based on your framework, grief and depression. I think teasing those things apart is relatively new, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and just like you said, for a long time, the best theor theoretical framework that we had for grief was Kubler-Ross's theory that was based on death and dying, um, not just on grief in uh, an expansive way. So what, and you, I love how you talk about getting at grief from a non, recognizing the non-intellectual component of grief. Mm -hmm. um, what is your theoretical framework for grief? And how does that, how does your framework inform how you treat grief and see it in a non-intellectual way? Uh, yeah, and it, I do, I do brain spotting work, which is a brain body based psychotherapy. And so I can give you the kind of framework from a brain science kind of point of view and how I would process grief in that way. Um, and I, I can kind of point out, I think some of how it overlaps with the grief recovery method definitely would want to focus on the brain and you probably, you're a neuroscience uh, genius in, in recovery. <laughs> I'm a neuroscientist in recovery. <laughs> in recovery. <laughs> recovery. Um, so I will speak to what I know, but I do know that um, grief affects the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex. And so, you know, the limbic system, of course, that kind of reptilian part of the brain that seek um, kind of scans and sees some kind of threat and can respond in this sort of hyper hypo regula regulation. Well, that part of the brain, you know, is connected to the brain stem and the body, all the organs. And so when, when negative experiences, that kind of emotional energy gets stored in the neural connections of the brain and it doesn't get to be processed, um, it gets stuck there and it causes, it can cause a lot of physical problems. And that part of the brain is totally overlapping with the part of the brain that feels pain and experiences pain. So that's why people describe so much. They can describe so many physical symptoms, right? When they're grieving, like we talk about a broken heart for a reason, mm. right? We really feel that. And there's even, you know, broken heart syndrome where it can, you know, lead to like death, increased blood pressure, and blood clots and all these things. And then the prefrontal cortex, of course, that's the part where your memory is affected, your ability to multitask, these kinds of things, which a lot of people describe for concentration. Um, so, so that's my framework. Um, that's how I think about it. And that's how I explain it to people. And I, I think that that tends to give a little bit of distance from somehow like over identifying like with the grief, like somehow, like I can't get over this, some, something's wrong with me, or I feel shame about still, still being in this process. No, it's really like your brain is wired to respond. This is some kind of emotional threat. Brain doesn't know if it's a physical threat or an emotional threat. It doesn't decipher. It just reacts from that same place. And then it gets stored there. And like in brain spotting, we call it a trauma capsule. So it's brain spotting trauma capsule. It's all these like, I think like science fiction words, but this, this kind of trauma capsule, it's just a way of talking about that energy that gets stored in those nerve connections of the brain. And so with the brain spotting work, um, it what, is. What do you mean by stored? Um, stuck. Stuck. Yeah, stuck. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's kind of a, a need for that to um, get resolved in some way, like an unwinding that needs to happen, right? A uh, discharge um, that needs to happen. Yes, Peter Levine talked about like the trauma cycle and mm -hmm. how animals, they're able to complete the trauma cycle, but humans, we intellectualize and so and we suppress our emotions and so right. completing the trauma cycle we get things like post-traumatic stress right when we're in hypo arousal so normally animals when they go into hypo arousal that's their when they play dead or 
um, right. like the possum plays dead, or for us, it looks like depression. Mm-hmm. Um, and but an animal, he says, out in the wild, an animal doesn't tell themselves, "Don't be depressed, don't ruminate." You got to look strong. Instead, they they're more able to, or they are able, or they die to complete the trauma cycle, and so they'll shake off the extra energy by convulsing or running extra miles Mm -hmm. um, like the gazelle does that but humans instead of completing the trauma cycle and releasing the energy we intellectualize and and Mm -hmm. and that's part of what stymies completing the trauma cycle he says is is that intellectualizing that's right is that in line with brain absolutely that's kind of um i feel like what you just said is a perfect kind of a marriage between what we talk about in the grief recovery method and brain spotting. Um, yeah, right on. So completing the, the trauma cycle, and we're using the word trauma now, but often, you know, grief and trauma. So, so in, um, in brain spotting, is completing the trauma cycle, is that the, what did you call it, the pain capsule? The grief the capsule. capsule. The trauma. Yeah. Okay, so is that is that the same thing in that language? What we I guess what we call is mindful processing. Okay. So it's it's um, and the important piece here is that um, you know David Grand discovered he did EMDR. Um, he was a master clinician of EMDR, and in doing that work, um, he was working with an with a um, professional ice skater. Um, I think she was like 16 years old and had been doing work with her for over a year um, because she couldn't land the triple loop. And she, and when he, you know, EMDR is not a fixed position, you know, it goes back and forth and there's this bilateral work and I'm not an EMDR clinician. So I'm speaking very shallowly about it right now, but um, he discovered when he was working with her, um, on some material around her parents' divorce, which would elicit a grief response, right? Um, if your parents get divorced, um, that there was some sort of jerking of the eyes. And so intuitively he held his finger still. And literally what we do now in brain spotting is find a fixed eye position. And in that fixed position, she actually processed all of the kind of emotional distress of the moment that their her parents were getting a divorce and you know her mother said we're getting a divorce and it's because of you and it was um all of this kind of material that she had not gotten to and so you know it was emotional it was physical and it all kind of came out and it came to some kind of resolution she felt better and then later that day she she called him and said, I can land the triple loop. So it's later it's, than a day. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I know. It's a cool story. And, but it's also a good way to illustrate like how we can find a literally a brain spot to access. Now we're going in to find that trap trauma capsule so that through the mindful processing where we encourage the client, Hey, just go with that. You know, whatever that wave is right now, let's see where that goes and just try to notice that without any judgment. Um, We're just really guiding them to have a mindful processing of anything that comes up. And there can be a lot that comes up. Um, A lot of physical sensations, memories, thoughts, insights, emotional material. And it comes to a resolution. And so, and you can, because the brain is designed to protect you too. So it can go into dissociation to protect you, right? And, um, and so there can be these waves of different experiences in the process. There can be, there can be grief that comes up. There can be anxiety, anger, and then of course, like a lot of physical sensations, but it all passes and it goes ebbs and flows. It's, it's um, definitely um, coming from the foundational work that Peter Levine did, and it's it's coming from the work the EMDR, but it's its own thing. But that's kind of the process.
Yeah. I guess you could compare to what Peter Levine says, completing the trauma. Hmm. So it sounds a little bit more flexible than EMDR. It's much more flexible in my understanding of what EMDR is very specific protocol. Mm -hmm. um, brain spotting is much more flexible and can be easily, um, easily adapted and um, integrated into other approaches. Can you do it on yourself? You can. Have you done it on yourself? I have. Does it work? Yes. Would you want to share an experience? Um, you don't have to go into detail. I'm just let me tell you how I use it on kind of a day to day basis. Okay. Yeah. Um, so with brain spotting, there's a lot of different techniques that we use. One of them is called gaze spotting. So the kind of protocol is okay, notice the activation, and we even want to get that activation up to like a six, you know, on a scale from zero to one to ten six or more so that it lights up that part of the brain that you want to treat. From there, we go looking for a spot where you um, maybe experience a similar activation. But we always follow the client. Like if a client feels drawn to process in one spot, fine. So, you know, kind of on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm a pretty highly sensitive person. That's just how my nervous system is wired. So, I can get irritable easily by loud sounds or a lot of overstimulation or TV, a lot of people talking kind of thing. So what I kind of discovered that I can do when I think of it and remember to do is I can kind of just start gazing around and looking for a spot where I feel kind of neutral or calm or a little more relaxed, um, which is part of what we do in brain spotting. Sometimes we process from a more kind of what we call resourced place. Right. It's more neutral. And I can just kind of hang out with that spot so that I can feel a little bit more regulated. Now, that would be a more of a kind of, I use it more in a resource kind of way on a kind of daily basis for myself um, because I know that where you look determines how you feel. And if I'm looking over here and feeling really irritable, I don't want to look over here anymore unless I'm with a therapist trying to process something about irritability, right? but I'm just trying to like regulate myself. So I'm going to look for another spot where I feel that. And, and so um, that's just kind of a, that's kind of a way that I use it. Um, I've done it once to, by myself to try to kind of process some other trauma and that I probably wouldn't recommend or do it ever again. Mm. <laughs> You know, in brain spotting, we have that kind of what we call this dual attunement. And so we're, well, we're attuning and we're watching. We're looking for jerks in the eyes, any kind of swallowing, any kind of, you know, any kind of physical movements that let us know something's happening. Um, something's going on there with the brain and that's a cue to us. But we're also really holding the space, you know, um, with a lot of presence, loving presence, not analytical, not intellectual. We're not trying to form any kind of um, sort of case analysis of what's going on. We're just really being present and paying attention. Um, and sort of in our mind's eye, like giving all this compassion and hopefulness for this client to move through this. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of need that piece to yeah. do some of the, the deeper work. Right. Yeah, because the deeper work, I mean, if, if you could do it yourself, if you could resource yourself, it wouldn't, you wouldn't have sunk down so low to begin with. That's right. And in the same way, if we go back to the grief recovery method, once we go through those steps, much of them are psychoeducation, like really kind of challenging your belief system and all these tools that have been passed down to us, those sort of statements I was talking about before. Once you go through that, and then we look, at, we look at loss over a life, your lifetime, and we really define that when we send people to do that assignment, any negative experience that you've had, put it on a graph, <laughs> and then you focus on whatever it is that you really want to get relief from. So if it was a loss of a loved one, a pet, or um, a major change in your life, so that's where you're going to get to the place where you're going to focus on what are the emotional statements that I need to make about this. Maybe I already did with this person, but they didn't hear it in the way that I needed them to. 
maybe I never got to say this, and so I need a chance to say it now, but it all kind of gets funneled into a letter that needs to be read in the session, but has to be witnessed again, like in the brain spotting. There needs to be a space that's held there so this person is witnessed, right? Yeah, so it sounds like your approach is two-pronged. One is like the brain spotting approach where you look and you see, do you use the finger like in EMDR or? Um, in the brain spotting, you certainly could use the finger, but you're holding a fixed position. So it would be really hard to hold your hand, arm up that long. So we have a we have this pointer here, and so we you know we can guide the client with the pointer. But again, we do it in so many different kinds of ways. You know, one eye open, one eye closed. I you know, to find the the activation that we're looking for. And when we do it online, we don't use any of those things. We just help the client to find the fixed eye position by themselves. Mm. So. Okay, so is it like you use brain spotting to find where the trauma is, what, where it is in the brain, what it is, and then you use more of an intellectual component to process it? Like, for example, with a letter, or can you talk more about how, how you use those two things, like you mentioned a letter, and then also brain spotting to find the trauma and process the trauma? So, so I'm typically doing these as separate treatments mm -hmm. and it's not because I don't think that they would um, blend well together, but there is kind of this belief that the grief recovery method should be done as the grief recovery method. It's a very pure kind of like do it this way. Oh, okay. Um, so how do you so I would do that separately with the letter at the end that I was talking about. Okay. So we talked about brain spotting. Maybe it makes sense to talk about the grief recovery and then how do you choose which one? Yeah, that's a good question. So the grief recovery method, as I was saying, is those first couple steps where you're getting a lot of psychoeducation and you're really trying to like debunk all of those myths that you learned, mm -hmm. um, those intellectual comments, challenge your own belief system, look at loss over a lifetime. You can kind of see what your patterns are and what you've learned about grief and how to deal with it. Focus on one relationship or one loss and identify what you want to express based on all of the experiences with them, positive and negative. You're expressing in the form of any significant emotional statements, forgiveness statements, apology statements, and then you're funneling them into a letter that you're reading out loud with the therapist and literally saying goodbye to it. Um, so that's its own process. It's a, it's a, um, it's a six to eight step process, depending if you do it individually or with a group. And so it's got a clear beginning, middle, and end. Um, and so there's that. And then the brain spotting can be it easily it could be integrated into this process. And I may go kind of back and forth in sessions of doing one or the other. I just really, what I do is I tell clients when they come in with grief, want to work on processing grief, I say, these are the two processes that I do. And I kind of feel it out with them. What, what do you think? What would you be interested in? And follow their kind of intuition about it. The grief recovery method can be really challenging when you get to that point of really trying to write that letter. And for some people, that's where they'll drop out because it's just too hard. And so I may go into the brain spotting and do brain spotting with them. So there can be a little more space for them. And then sometimes they're able to go back and complete it. You know, I find it fascinating that what causes tremendous grief for one person might not cause tremendous grief for someone else. Have you noticed any themes on what causes, like what's the hook? And grief. So, and you're kind of wondering why is that that some people experience it so much more intensely? Yeah. So, like, have you noticed any like a common denominator that makes that's going to make something more painful for someone and not for someone else? Like, for example, is it expectation? Mm. Like high expectation around some a situation that makes it more of something to 
more of a loss or is it more attachment or is it more identity enraptured or mm -hmm. have you noticed anything like that? Mm -hmm. Well, what I, what I notice is um, when somebody has experienced a lot of loss or mm -hmm. trauma in their life and they have not been able to process it, it's unresolved. Um, that's when, uh, when they come into my office because, you know, maybe their mother or father died and that was, this is the most kind of significant loss for them because of the bond there, the bond of the relationship. But really part of the reason why it's so intense for them is because of all these other losses that they've experienced that have not been resolved. So it's a compounding effect. Yes, it's a cu grief is cumulative by nature and it's cumulatively negative. So I think that's one explanation of why somebody might experience something more intensely. Um, we also talk about, we do talk about bond and duration. You know, if you've had a long relationship with somebody with a really significant deep bond, that can amount to a pretty strong grief response. Sometimes people have such an intense bond with somebody and it's in a short amount of time, but that bond is there, that significant connection where you know, maybe somebody really got you and you felt like really home with them. That could amount to a, a great grief response, but we're definitely careful not even to kind of go into the, like comparing. Why is this harder for you than it is for me? Mm -hmm. that tends to kind of elicit the, the self-judgment. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And there's actually a great podcast. Do you like Brene Brown? Oh, yeah. A recent one with her new podcast um, about comparative suffering. Oh, okay. Check it out. Yeah. Yeah. But it is, but from, from an intellectual place, there is a kind of wondering and curiosity about why do people experience this differently? Mm -hmm. You know, and then of course, I'm sure there's a whole lot of spiritual ideas about that as well. You know, um, even just from a Buddhist perspective of like, hey, this is not the only bond that I've had with this person, but I've had a bond with them in, in other lifetimes, right? Mm -hmm. So, so then you talk, start talking about karma, right? And then that's a whole nother thing to explain why it could be more intense for somebody. Yeah. Is that what you believe? Yeah. I mean, you know that. Yeah. <laughs> now I want to talk about karma. I know. <laughs> it's very tempting. Yeah, you know, I had a thought recently. Uh, I feel like it's possible, totally non-falsifiable, -falsi but it's possible that our ideas about reincarnation and next life and life after death are you know is it possible or probable that it's suspending us in a state of non-acceptance and denial mm -hmm. giving us comfort yeah it's interesting because on one hand it's it's meaning mm -hmm. which is the new sixth stage it's an addendum to kubler ross Meaning, really? Yeah, I meaning, yeah. I forget who it was, but there's a new, um, there's new addendum to Kubler-Ross by, yeah. I forget who, but the sixth stage is meaning. And um, so it's interesting because things like religion, I mean, you could see them adding a, a braid of, of all of the stages, which mm -hmm. we talked about aren't necessarily stages or linear processes, but but then again, it could also be denial. So it's it's just really... It's interesting to think about. Yeah, I think anything that interrupts your emotional process and doesn't allow for your natural feelings is um, problematic. And mm -hmm. sometimes that can be, you know, religious, spiritual beliefs. Right. But at the same time, those are what can, what can be what give us the most hope, which is most that hope and comfort, which hopefulness is really important. Yeah. What's your advice in, in both how does someone know if they're in an intellectual state of processing their grief? Like how does, what's a tell, is there like a tell, a tell 
telltale sign that someone is intellectualizing and not really moving through it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would probably, probably kind of check to see with somebody what they're experiencing in their body when they're talking about it. Mm -hmm. And if, if they're not aware of what's going on in their body, that might be a, a sort of sign that they're not in their emotional experience. And what do you mean by, I think I take it for granted as, you know, being in psychology that I know what that means. How do you explain that to people who, right. like, in my body, like, of course I'm in my body. What is <laughs> yeah, right, right. No, I totally get that. So, you know, I might even do like a, a divide up, a, a kind of brain or a body scan, like just stay in this region. What are you noticing in your head? Any tension? any lack of feeling, um, any neutral feeling, come from here down to your you know, hip, what are you noticing? And that's where usually if you can help someone to hyper-focus on where you start to notice stuff, right? Heaviness in your chest, a clenching in your stomach, um, these kinds of things. And so that's what I'm talking about, but it does, for some people who've never had that experience or have, known to value that as a way of understanding their their internal experience you know it can take a little time and practice mm -hmm. just kind of mindfully noticing what's going on in your body right but that might be one um one sign for me and and intuitively maybe i can just kind of feel like energetically they're kind of more in a heady place so i might just check in and slow them down okay so if you're noticing that little bit of tension in your chest so let's just see where that goes you know and then kind of give it some space mm -hmm. so based on how you feel or your understanding about how grief is stored in the body and then having it be a sign that someone has unprocessed grief by being detached from their mm -hmm. bodily sensations how do those two go together so, so being kind of detached from your, you yeah, know, I'm thinking about how that, that is a sign based on your theory of how grief works. Well, when I think about detached, I kind of think about that more of a hypo, um, regulatory state, which is really just, you know, detachment, um, dissociation, shutdown, depression, all of those, those kind of fall into that hypo regulation. It's really a way of, for the brain to protect you, right? From the, from the pain. So I would normalize that. And then I start to talk about the kind of whole concept of the window of tolerance, mm -hmm. the hyper regulation, the window of tolerance, the hypo regulation, right? What happens if we stay in the hypo or the hyper too long? This gets thinner and thinner, right? And so our ability to be calm and curious um, about what's going on in our experience, what's why is my why is my heart racing so much, right? Gets thinner and thinner, and it's more and more difficult to access a place of calm. Mm. It's more and more difficult for the nervous system to to reset, right? And that's problematic. You know, you, then you're going to start kind of becoming really familiar with a hypo-regulatory state where you're detached often. Things will be suppressed. Mm -hmm. right? So when people are intellectualizing instead of feeling their feelings, are they more likely to be either in the hyper-arousal or the hypo-arousal? Or That's a good question. I would say the hypo because I see a lot more dissociation, detachment, um, withdrawing, um, uh, as a kind of protector showing up. And then is the intellectualizing, because when we're in hypo arousal, we tend to lose time because of mm -hmm. the frontal mm -hmm. cortex going offline and mm -hmm. dissociation. Mm -hmm. And then we tend to intellectualize and come up with stories that account for the lost time. Is right. that... Is that kind of what you would say, or would you say something different about an over intellectual presentation for processing grief? Well, I think that an over intellectual presentation is also a coping mechanism, right? And it's also a way 
that we detach from the emotional experience. So is it like we are staying, so then based on that, does over-intellectualizing allow us to stay in the green window of tolerance? Mm, maybe for a while, but it's not, it's, it's not going to, um, for the long term, yeah. it's, it's not going to be, um, it's not going to be helpful because once something else happens, once one more loss occurs mm-hmm. or you go into COVID because that's a kind of existential threat and it's a great response on its own, then all of that stuff is going to come up again. And so maybe you go, you're going to go from intellectualizing um, to detach to now you're going to go to dissociation, right? Mm-hmm. Which, is a li- which is even a little bit different. I see. And, I, and I'm not saying these are bad or wrong. Right. They're totally normal. And, you know, detachment is also like, something, you know, like in, in Buddhism, that's really encouraged, right. <laughs> you know, so it's not, to, it's encouraged to, to sort of hone that skill. It's not a, it's a helpful skill, mm-hmm. it's a really helpful skill, um, especially if, it, if it's this kind of compassionate detachment, right? Yeah, I mean, it's more of a mindful, not clinging on for dear life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think dissociation is more of the appropriate way of talking about the hypo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How would you say that working with grief has impacted you as a person? Have you noticed, have you noticed anything different in, you know, Megan? I think you're, (laughs) how many years in are you with this focus? I think five. Um, Yeah, I guess so. Five or six. Um, And when you say that, do you mean like working with clients with grief or my own personal grief? Or I think, Well, I think that the work that you do has an impact on you, right? And It does. It and does. So I wonder, I mean, not everyone is comfortable with grief. Like this is arguably one of the hardest psychological experiences that we can go through, psychological, mm-hmm. social, emotional. Mm-hmm. And, um, so not only are you holding that for people, but you're helping them move through it. And I wonder just how, how that has impacted you. It, it does really impact me. Um, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm very highly sensitive. So I'm quite spongy. <laughs> so I, I do, I do take on, um, And that's something, you know, that's kind of been a lifelong process for me of learning what that's about, how to take care of that. Um, But I certainly am grateful to these two approaches because they, they're their own container for the work. And so I do find that I have, I don't have to take on as much Mm. um, because the, the steps in the grief recovery method hold the process, the emotional experience for the client. The brain spotting allows um, for that client um, to be held. I mean, obviously, I'm still holding space for these people, and it affects me. I mean, if it didn't affect me, I would be concerned, <laughs> um, you know, because I'm, I'm having to attune to what's going on and pay really close attention. So the kind of presence and then just the heaviness of grief, it does affect me. <sighs> But I also, you know, it's fulfilling because I, it helps people. I do see that it's helping people. Um, both approaches are really helping people. It helps my clients and they make a lot of progress. So it's really satisfying. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't notice so much all of the, the, the difficulty, the heaviness, all of that when I'm in the session because I'm, I'm really in the session. But you know, after a few sessions like that, yeah, I'm tired and fatigued and, Mm -hmm. um, and I feel it, I feel it in my body. And so the holding, so I am learning about that. I'm always constantly learning to go to the client, back to myself, to the client, back to myself. Am I holding tension in my shoulders as I'm listening? Okay. Breathe and relax that tension. You know, I'm going back and forth. What's going on with me? That certainly tells me what's going, gives me information about what's going on with them. 
but also to take care of myself. Yeah. Yeah. That's really inspiring for me. I, I was just, uh, reflecting on that myself and I, you know, it's maybe much more philosophical, you know, I'm now obsessed before, you know, where I didn't think I could, I didn't want to work with people who were suicidal or extremely Mm -hmm. depressed. Um, because I think part of in working with people, those aspects of yourself, you have to make that available to your clients. Or I don't think that just based on my own theory, I don't think that you can incite much movement in the client unless you're, unless you make your similar wounds also available. Yeah. Um, which, you know, like orientations like cognitive behavioral therapy don't, don't allow for that or don't, don't require that. But based on my own theory, I, I think, um, I like therapy that, that does use the therapist to yeah. impact. I mean, I think part of what draws me to it is that it does make me so much more curious about pain and the function of grief. And then I get to talk about it with people like you who do this very heavy, impactful, you know, the Christie five years ago would have thought it was scary work. Mm-hmm. And now I, and now I just think it's so beautiful and, and deep. It is beautiful and deep. And I think that you need a structure for this work so that there's some kind of completion, mm-hmm. you know, actually what's more dangerous in my opinion for both client and therapist is if you're just talking and talking and talking about it you know, without any real action, um, evidence-based actions that you can take, like these two, um, you can get enmeshed in it, in the story around it. And it's easy for these, even the grief share groups to be helpful at first, but then over time people find, oh, you know, it's just, just exactly. Rumination, vicariousness. One of the most beneficial things that I um, had heard about grief work based on somatic experiencing Peter Levine's work is that, you know, you want to hear the story, but you want to hear it in a way that is therapeutic and not re-traumatizing. Exactly. So Megan, if there's one thing about grief that you could share with the world, what would it be? I do really want people to know that it's a normal and natural process. There's nothing um, pathological about it at all. You know, it's one of our shared sufferings. Yeah. And so, you know, we all are, we all experience it. You know, if there's just to say, just to try to work to normalize it, if people can try to normalize it for themselves and for others, when you see grievers and you talk to them, if just listening to people and reflecting, that sounds really hard. That's so devastating, you know. I can't even imagine what, how devastating that is for you. Just these simple comments um, that acknowledge the emotional toll. They can just go such a long way for somebody, just such a long way to just help someone to feel less alone. Hmm. So I would just challenge people to just think about how do you respond to people who are grieving? Can you be um, a little quieter? <laughs> and just listen. Mm -hmm. And um, for people who are grieving, just know that this is a normal process. It doesn't feel normal. It doesn't feel good, but there's, you don't have to have any shame about it. Please don't believe that you're never going to get over this loss. It's going to be there forever. I think that's a misconception too. There are, there are ways to move through it and to really honor the process and, and complete it. What's a sign someone should seek extra tools and not just let time? That's a good question. I think any grief response, grief experience that is significantly impacting you, your life, if it's hard to go to work, if it's hard to go to school, if it's hard to just kind of function, hard to get out of bed, you know, you're, you're really grieving, you should, you should seek out some help. Well, thank you, Megan. I really enjoyed yeah. talking to you. You too, Christy. It's so great to see you. Thanks for, um, thanks for asking me to do this. Yeah, thank you.